Welcome to an overview of LifeWay's Explore the Bible lesson for Sunday School teachers and Bible study leaders. This passage this week is Acts chapter 3, verses 12 through 26, with the title of Placed for Sunday, June 23rd, 2024. A good way to begin this lesson, I believe, would be to ask your group to share a time when you heard somebody purposefully give God the glory for something good that had happened. For example, recently the University of Oklahoma women's softball team won their fourth straight NCAA Women's College World Series. They gave God the glory for what they'd done. I'm quoting here from the Western Journal, uh, it says, Just minutes after the final out, ESPN reporter Holly Rowe uh, spoke uh, to Sooners pitcher Kelly Maxwell, who made it known who she attributed the victory to. Quote, I know I was going to give all the glory to God, Maxwell said. But it wasn't just Maxwell who put her faith on display. Her teammate, outfielder Riley Boone, made sure to give praise to God during the postgame press conference. Commenting on the season, Boone said she felt God's, quote, hand over this program, end quote, more than ever. People are watching us. They're asking questions about why do you do what you do? How are you even able to do this? And the answer is always God, she added. That's from the Western Journal, June 7th, 2024. A lot of examples of things like this. Uh, you and your group can share the times they've seen on television and other places. Uh, then say this morning, as we continue our study in the book of Acts, we see where Peter and the apostles also gave God the glory for what he did among them. And they used it as an opportunity to share the gospel. Our, in context, our focus passage for today is Acts 3, 12 through 26, as I mentioned. But to understand it, you really have to place it in its context, starting in verse 1 of chapter 3. As we saw last week, the Holy Spirit had come upon the early church at Pentecost. 3,000 people were saved. Then we saw in verses 41 through 47 some of the characteristics of that newborn church. Baptism, devotion to the word, love and fellowship, and so on. Which brings us then to chapter 3, which says that Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. There's actually two Jewish hours of prayer, the first one at 9 a.m., the second at 3 in the afternoon. Interestingly, these are the very hours that Jesus spent on the cross. Verse 2 says, as, as they came in, uh, a lame man was there begging alms, but Peter said to him those famous words in verse 6, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, walk. And he was healed, and everyone was amazed. Verse 11 says, all the people ran together to them at the so-called portico of Solomon, full of wonder. Now, just to set the context in your group's mind, you might share a visual of the portico of Solomon and like this, like this and say, this is where our lesson for this week takes place. The, the, the portico or, or colonnade of, of Solomon is a porch on the outer part of the temple complex. Uh, it, uh, the, the temple is this squarish building in the middle here. And this portico or porch is this area back here. This is where uh, Peter and, uh, and the disciples were when they met this man and, and all this happens. It just, just helped get that in the mind of, of your group. I think it'll help a little bit if you can have something like that to, for them to visualize. That, that brings us then to our focus passage for the week, starting in verse 12. For an outline, uh, I'm going to share something like this. Point one, deflecting the glory, verses 12 and 13a. Uh, point two, sharing the gospel, 13b through 21. Point three, laying the scriptural foundation, verses 21 through 25. And then four, making the personal application, uh, we see especially in verse 26. So let's get into the text. Uh, first of all, uh, deflecting the glory, uh, Verse 12 says, when, when Peter saw this, the, the amazement of the people, he replied to them, Men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety we had made him walk? One of the first things that jumped out to me when I began looking at this text was, was the pronouns here in verse 12. Peter said, why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety we had made him walk? Uh, three times in this verse, three times here, he says, it's not us, it's not our, it's not we. But not only does he point them away from himself and, and the other apostles, he points them to God in verse 13. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he decided to release him. So Peter said, listen, everybody, we didn't do this. Only God did this. He's very specific about which God it was, uh, wasn't he? Uh, he gave all the praise and glory to God for, for what had happened. And he wasn't, that, wasn't being modest either, right? I mean, did, did Peter have the power to take this man by the hand and, and make him walk? Absolutely not. Only God could have done that. So Peter was totally correct in giving God the credit for this. And he's a good example for us too, right? 
when good things happen in our lives or in our church, we need to make sure we give God the credit for it. Glorify him, not ourselves, not the church, not anybody else. James 1.17 says, Every good thing given and every perfect gift uh, is from above, coming down from the Father of light. God is the source of everything good, and we need to give glory to him for all that he gives us. That's the attitude we need to constantly emulate as God's people. Glorify him. Point people to him. Our church celebrated the 10th anniversary of our minister of music, uh, Kyle Chamblin, last Sunday. One of the things I love about Brother Kyle is that he always says, I don't want people to leave here saying what a great choir they have. I want them to leave here saying what a great God they have. That's just what Peter was saying here. It's not us. It's God. Too often people are found guilty of trying to take credit for what God does, and that is a dangerous place to be. As King Herod saw in Acts 12, 20 through 25, Herod gave a speech to the people of Tyre and Sidon, and verse 22 says, the people cried out, the voice of a God and not a man. And verse 23 says, immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and died. What a grotesque picture. But it's very symbolic, showing just how grotesque it is when we try to take the credit and glory that should be, belong to God alone. It's, it's wormy. It, it's hideous. It's grotesque. Well, we've all seen people, and perhaps we've even been some people sometimes, who tried to take credit for things we did not do. It is ugly. It's wormy. Don't be like that. Let's always give God the glory. There's a great song that Ron and Patricia Owen sung years ago called Touch Not the Glory, and it goes like this. Have you been called to serve where others tried and failed? And with God's help and strength, your efforts have prevailed? Touch not the glory. Have you some special gift, some riches you can share? Or are you called of God to intercessory prayer? Touch not the glory. Has God appointed you to some great noble cause or put you where you hear the sound of man's applause? Touch not the glory. A watching world still waits to see what can be done through one who touches not that which is God's alone, touch not the glory, touch not the glory, touch not the glory, for it belongs to God. It's a good word for us, isn't it? Touch not the glory, for it belongs to God. Don't try to take credit for what God has done. Touch not the glory. Always give credit and glory to him. Remember, we are not being humble when we give God glory. He really is the source of all good things. We should give him credit. If God knows you'll point people to him, then he will be free to use you in great ways. In, in 1 Samuel 2.30, God said, uh, those who honor me, I will honor. Let, let's be among those who are always honoring him. Like Peter, let's point people to him. And point two, then is sharing the gospel, verses 13 through 21. Here again, uh, now we see Peter sharing what we called the last time the kerygma, K-E-R-Y-G-M-A, a Greek word meaning the proclamation, the basic gospel proclamation of the apostles, which, which we discussed in, in Acts 2 when Peter first shared the message. We talked about how there are four basic gospel elements that are contained in every good gospel presentation. God had a plan, uh, we sinned, uh, God raised him up, and you need to respond. And those same four basic elements are also present here in Peter's sermon in Acts 3 as well. You could either just point these out to your group uh, from Peter's uh, sermon in, in verses 13 through 21, or what I intend to do uh, with our class is to get them involved, hands-on, in studying God's Word, is a photocopy, a page from the Bible that has these verses on it and distribute it to them. And then after reviewing the, the four basic gospel elements on the board, I'm going to ask them, underline or highlight on this page where you see one of these four points in this scripture so that they can highlight all these different places like I've done here on that page. A good way to get, get some hands-on study of God's word in your group. And by the way, the, the places I see the, the, the gospel elements here uh, in verses 13 through 22 include uh, God's plan uh, in verse 18, where it says the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of the prophets, God's plan. Verse 21, again, all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. God had a plan. 
but man's sin. We see it in verse 14. You disown the holy and righteous one and ask for a murder to be granted to you. Verse 15, you put to death the prince of life. Verse 17, you acted in ignorance just as your rulers also did. So all of those indicate man's need. Then God's provision. Verse 15, the prince of life whom God raised from the dead. Verse 16, it's the name of Jesus that strengthened this man. And man's response, what kind of response do we need to make to that? He tells us in verse 19, therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away. And again, verse 16, in the basis of faith in his name, it's the name of Jesus, which is strength in this man. So there's some, there's one of every one of those four points contained here in Peter's message. He, he does share the kerygma, the basic points of the gospel. You might see others here as well. Your group might see some others. You could keep track of these on your dry erase board or, or whatever as your class shares them. But, but do point out uh, these basic elements of the gospel that we see in this passage and remind them that these, the, the, there, there are these truths. Number one, uh, that, that we need to, to understand. We need to understand these things in order to be saved. We need to know God has a plan for us to be in heaven with him, but our sin keeps him out. But he sent Jesus to die for our sins and rise again to be our savior. And that we too need to repent and return to him through faith in Jesus to be saved. Encourage anybody who hasn't done this to do it today. But then secondly, not only do we each need to receive this, this is what we need to share. This is what we need to be sharing with other people. So encourage them to learn this, memorize this outline, practice it, so they can just share it personally and, and naturally with, with people the Lord gives them an opportunity to witness to. This gospel message that, that Peter and the apostles shared is the same basic content that we need to share when we tell others about the Lord too. God has a plan, but we have a need. God made provision for it in Jesus, but we've got to respond and receive that message. And then notice again in the response section in verse 19, it mentions the importance of repentance again. We, we talked about this last time. The first word out of Peter's mouth in Acts 2 when the crowd asked him what they should do in response to the gospel was repent. As we saw, to repent means a change of mind that leads to a change of direction in the life, just like we see in the prodigal son. Salvation is not just a matter of believe who Jesus is. Listen, the devil believes who Jesus is. He, he knows it better than we do. Our response has to be to personally repent of our sins and put our personal trust in Jesus as our own Lord and Savior. This the devil has not done, and neither have a lot of people who need to hear the true gospel response from us. But Peter shared the gospel here with a man the Lord put right before him. And it was obviously what one might call a divine appointment, a God-given opportunity to share the gospel with somebody. Of course, we see a number of divine appointments in Scripture, including here, again in Acts 8, Philip and the Ethiopian, Acts 10, Peter and Cornelius, and, and so on. You might ask your class in this point to share a time when they had a divine appointment, when some time that they were able to witness or, or minister to somebody. For example, just a few weeks ago, we had a Roundup outreach event here at our church, and I ended up talking to a young man who brought his wife and two small children to the Roundup. As we talked, it just naturally unfolded into an opportunity for me to share the gospel. I still have this young man, Anthony, and his family on my prayer list, but I, I believe that was a divine appointment. You can share opportunities like that that you've had. Your group can share some that they've had. Divine appointments. And either at this point or maybe at the end of your class, include in your prayer time uh, that you would ask God that he might give you and your class some divine appointments to share this week. Then point three, then laying the scriptural foundation. We see this in verses 22 through 26. After Peter shares the basic gospel story in verses 13 to 21, then he wraps up the message with some scriptural quotations. He begins the section in verse 21 talking about the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. So he's saying, listen, guys, we aren't just making this up as we go along. This has been predicted from of old. This is not some off-the-wall, unbiblical uh, teaching. This is what God promised you and what you've been waiting and praying for. Then he gives a couple of specific examples of how this was prophesied. Verse 22, he, he says, Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him, you shall give heed to everything he says to you. It's a quote from Deuteronomy 18:16. In the Old Testament, Moses was telling Israel at that point, just like God raised me up and you've been listening to me, so God is going to raise up another prophet like me. He says in verse 23 that whoever doesn't listen to this prophet will be destroyed. 
Then he says again in verse 24, and likewise all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announced these days. So he says all the prophets of the Old Testament prophesied about this. He's making this point. This is not some radical, unbiblical thing that we're preaching here. This is what God's word has prepared for you all along. And he says in, in verse 25, See yet another Old Testament scriptural reference. He says, It is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. It's, of course, a quote from Genesis 22, 18, which we just studied a few weeks ago, where God promised to bless the world through the seed of Abraham. Jesus is that seed, as the genealogies of Matthew and, and Luke make clear. Jesus didn't just pop up out of nowhere and, and claim to be the Messiah like a number of people have tried to do. He is the one who is prophesied in those Old Testament scriptures. And through all these examples here uh, and in, verses, uh, in verses 22 and 25, Peter's reminding both his current audience and us today of the biblical anchor of our faith. As we follow the Lord, we're not just making things up as we go along. Our faith is anchored in the word of God. Like the old hymn says, how firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. That reminds us not only of the scriptural foundations of our faith, but also that everything we do as God's people, especially in his church, should have a basis in scripture. We shouldn't just be out there doing stuff that we're dreaming up. We should be doing biblical stuff that has a purpose and foundation and direction in the word of God. And finally, verse 26, uh, making the personal application. Let, let's don't miss the significance of his, of his conclusion here. He says, for you first, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. This verse has several important elements in it. You could even ask your group, what, what all truths do you see here in this verse? Because there are several that they could point out. And they would include where he says, for you first. What does he mean for you first? Well, the gospel was for the Jews first, then for all the Gentiles who would also believe it. It's like Paul says in Romans 1, 16. The gospel is the power of salvation for all who believe to who? The Jew first and also to the Greek. That's what he's talking about here. So it's for you first. You're getting the first opportunity to respond to the good news of Jesus. And when he uses this you, he's making it personal for them. We have to personally respond to the gospel. And that is vital as we've seen a number of times. And secondly, he says, God raised up his servant. It's the resurrection, right? Uh, that, that's a part of the heart of the gospel. It's not only that Jesus died on the cross, but that he rose from the dead. Had he not risen, there would not be any gospel, as Paul makes clear in 1 Corinthians 15. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, he was just another dead philosopher like all the others. The thing that separates him from all those others is that he rose from the dead. Like Romans 1, 4 says, he is the only one who has declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. That's why Peter had the confidence that he did. What changed him from the coward who denied Jesus three times to the powerful preacher here? Well, don't underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit, but it's also the fact that he had seen Jesus alive. That made all the difference. And the resurrection certainly is a difference maker. In fact, notice uh, how Peter both begins and ends his sermon here in Acts 3 with references to Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Verse 15, near the beginning of his message, he calls him the Prince of Life, the one whom God raised from the dead. And now here again, in verse 26 at the end, he concludes, for you first, God raised up his servant. So he starts and ends with the resurrection. It had a vital place in his faith and preaching and teaching, and it should have a vital place in ours too. Our message is not just Jesus died on the cross, as important as that is, but that he proved it by rising from the dead. God raised up his servant. Then again, notice how it says, and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. Here's an important teaching. How, according to Peter here, will Jesus bless us? By turning every one of you from your wicked ways. See, it's important what he does not say. He does not say he'll bless you by making you rich. He does not say he will bless you by making you healthy. He does not say he will bless you by making you successful and giving you your best life now. No, he says he'll bless you, quote, by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. It is sin, our wicked ways, which has separated us from God and which has brought upon us all the problems that we have. So Jesus came to be God's solution to that problem. And notice that it doesn't just say he will forgive our sins, but that he will what? 
turn us from our wicked ways. That's significant. Jesus did not just come to forgive our sins and then we just keep on committing them. He came to do more than that. He came to turn us from our sins so that we are not living in them anymore. And that is a good reminder for us today. Jesus did not merely come to forgive you your sins, but to turn you from them. Don't be content just to keep asking him to forgive you for your same, same sins over and over. Ask him for the power to turn away from them so that you're not living in them anymore. Jesus does have the power to help us turn from sin. We have a young father in our Sunday school class who had a problem with alcohol. But last year, God got a hold of his life and he gave him the victory over that. He has been totally delivered from it. Jesus turned him from that sin. You can share that testimony if you'd like to, and or you and your group can share similar testimonies of how God has done similar things. And make the point, the same Jesus who gave them power to turn from sin in Acts 3 is the same Jesus who is alive today, and he ha does have the power to help us turn from sin. So let's not be content to just live in our same sins. Let's turn to him and let him bless us by turning us from our sins. And finally, notice who this verse is for. It says, every one of you, from, turn every one of you from your wicked ways. That blessing is for everyone, just like the scripture says. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Just like Peter said to the Jews here in Acts 3, for you first, we can apply God's word to our lives too. Tell your people this Sunday, this is for you. Jesus can work in their lives today, just like he did here in Acts 3. I hope this will help you as you get ready for this week. Remember, if you'd like to read or print out a text version of this overview uh, to print out this lesson, if you'd like to use it or use one of the quotes or stories, you can get that on my blog at www.seanethomas.com. I'll, I'll post that address in the comment section below. If you'll hit subscribe to this video, YouTube will automatically send you next week's lesson and you won't have to search for it. And if you write anything in the comments below, I'll be sure to pray for you and for your group by name this week. Per my licensing agreement with LifeWay, these weekly lessons are based on content from Explore the Bible Adult Resources. The presentation is my own. It has not been reviewed by LifeWay. LifeWay resources are available at GoExploreTheBible.com. GoExploreTheBible.com slash adults dash training. And if you have questions about Explore the Bible resources, you can send emails to ExploreTheBible at LifeWay.com. Hope to see you next week.